right, does anybody have any Bible questions this evening before we get started? There we go. All right. We're in John uh, chapter 1 and verse 14. John chapter 1 and verse 14. Okay, up to this point, uh, what we've noticed so far in the book of John is that John has framed his entire gospel around the creation account from Genesis 1. Because he starts off his book, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. And he talks about how all things came to being through him, that is the Word. So when we come down here to verse 14 and we read, the Word became flesh, we understand that this is talking about uh, Jesus and that Jesus pre-existed before the earth began and was involved in the creating of the world. And so when he talks about the word becoming flesh there in verse 14, uh, we need not think about this just as flesh as in our physical body. But what if you look back uh, to verse 12 and 13, he says this, But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And so Jesus was peculiar in that he wasn't just born of the will of God, he was born of the flesh as well, indicating that he was born through uh, natural means as well as supernatural means. And so when he says that Jesus became flesh, it's not simply talking about his fleshly body, uh, but it's talking about uh, the, the type of life that he would have to live. Um, he was descended, his, his, his genealogy mattered, who he was born to mattered. He could trace it back to David and Abraham. Saying Jesus was born in the flesh is similar to saying in Galatians 4, 4, but when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made under woman, made under law. That's the same idea found within this expression, Jesus, and, and the word became flesh. So it's not just talking about his body, but it's talking about the type of life that he would live. He, he was descended from Abraham. He was located in that realm of the flesh. Uh, he, was, um, he was born under the law. He had to live according to the law. And so... He says in uh, this passage that the word became flesh, but then he says he dwelt among us. Now the word dwelt there seems like a pretty simple, straightforward word, but really uh, if you look at my version, it has a little tabernacle. The word there is tabernacled, and the word, and the word tabernacled among us. So for example, in uh, Revelation chapter 21, the Apostle John is the only ones that use, he's the only one in the whole New Testament that uses that word, dwelt. Uh, in uh, Revelation chapter 21 and verse 3, he says, I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. He will dwell among them. He will tabernacle among them. And they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. Well, they have the same connotation, like in Hebrew, where it's not Hebrew, but in Corinthians, where it says, we know about earthly tabernacle was dissolved. We have a home eternal. Um, not the, not the same, not the same word there. But uh, this this is more talking about Jesus setting up his tent and living among the people, um, being in their midst, being in their camp is more the idea. Uh, the the passage that you're talking about, he says, if our earthly tent is Dissolve. We have a tabernacle from God made in the heavens. So I guess it's it's connected, but it's not exactly the same. Um, this one means to dwell among, whereas the other one is a noun indicating the actual dwelling, uh, the actual tabernacle. Whereas this is a verb saying that he's tabernacling among them. If that makes sense. I think that that particular I think it's just mention a dwelling place. Right. 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 Yeah, so this, if this one was dissolved, God got a place of eternal Right, and so when he uses the word tabernacle here, dwelt here in verse 14, 
he's not really talking about the type of body that he had, but he's, he's using this expression because uh, this is what God did. No, no, I'm not talking about it. I'm talking about that, that, that same comment, uh, same expression it, of, of him, of God. Right. Coming and dwelling amongst his people. Yes. In, in Corinthians, where it's talking about the, the, our earthly tabernacle, is that we dwell amongst one another. We dwell in this earthly body that is prepared for us. Right. But one day that when this earthly body is no more, right. we have assurance that God has a place for us when we leave here. Leave right. this. When that earthly tabernacle no longer exists. Yeah, that's uh that's one way to read that passage in Second Corinthians five. But again, let me let me stress that this word here dwelt, he uh, he dwells among us. This is a word often used uh, concerning God where God dwells among his people. So I get what you're saying. We, d we d a tabernacle among, e among each other. And there may be a connection there, especially when talking about the flesh versus being born of the will of God. But um, I don't know. It's not like a one-to-one -one comparison. But I see, I see what you're getting at. The point is, is that uh, this expression, dwelt among us, is the same expression used of what God does with his people. He's, God dwells among his people. And so... Whenever, notice he says, and we saw his glory. So that's what happened in the Old Testament. Whenever they had built the tabernacle or built the temple, what would God do? He would bring among the people. Yeah, he had dwelled among the people and they would behold his glory in the cloud and in the uh, fire at night, right? Mm -hmm. So this is what, so, so John is taking that language of the Old Covenant times whenever God would come and dwell among his people and he's applying it to what Jesus did in coming to the earth he was dwelling among them he was displaying the glory and not just his glory but the glory uh, of the father through him and so so this is what this passage is doing is it's trying to bring our minds back to the old testament and the times whenever god would come and dwell in a tabernacle and be visible and it will you know in in the cloud and in the fire so well, does that have reference to the, the verse in Revelation that says that the temple of God is, is among the people, among it, his people? Exactly. That's the same expression used in Revelation 21 when it talks about uh, God coming to dwell among his people. Right? right? It's the same, same idea. All of it's trying to take you back to that old covenant language uh, in, the, in the temple, in tabernacle. So he says, uh, we saw his glory. He says, glory as of the only begotten from the Father. And then he says, he is full of grace and truth. Now take a moment real quick and go down to verse 17. He says, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were uh, realized or came to be through Jesus Christ. And so one way you could look at this is that Jesus is the fulfillment of the law. And when he talks about uh, grace and truth there, he is uh, talking about God, um, as he's going to say here in verse 18. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. And so whenever he talks about Jesus being full of grace and truth, what he's meaning is that Jesus is a personification of the grace and truth that belong to God. All of the attributes and everything that's attributed to God, Jesus demonstrates when he's on earth. Keith? You ever wonder why, um, in another version, I know in, in other versions it says, for the law came, by Mo, came through Moses, then it has, but, which is conjunction joining those two scriptures, those two phrases together. Right. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So was not the law, law full of grace? It, it was not. I know it wasn't full of grace and truth. It, although right. it was a heavenly law, it did. So the the law of Moses. Uh, this is a good question. So the law of Moses was definitely full of grace and truth. Uh -huh. All right, because because God allowed that system that He didn't have to allow uh, by which they could approach Him through the law. Now, if we look at Second Corinthians chapter three. Or, sorry, uh, well, we can look at 2 Corinthians 3, but maybe we ought to look at Romans 8. It kind of says it quicker than uh, 2 Corinthians 3. 
Notice what Paul says in Romans 8, 3. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did in sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit. So the law, see the, 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 the problem with the law wasn't a problem with the law itself but a problem with man because man could not keep all 613 commandments perfectly. They'd end up breaking one and separate themselves from God. And since the blood of bulls and goats couldn't take away sin, they had no way to completely 100% remedy that, uh, that disruption until the time of Christ. And so when he talks about grace and truth coming through Jesus what he's, and being realized in Jesus is that everything that the law was doing was trying to bring the people to Christ. And so while the law had grace and truth and foreshadows of what Jesus would do, it was ultimately fulfilled and revealed through him. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 talks about, in, in all of its verses, verses 1 through 18, how the law was given, but when the, when the people read the law because of the flesh, because of the flesh being their shortcomings and all that, they were not able to see God face to face through the law. He talked about, remember, a veil lied over their heart. But he said when someone turns to Christ, that veil is taken away. And so the old law by itself, without looking at it through Jesus, the way that Jesus has revealed it, presents a veiled view of God. It presents a veiled view uh, of truth because of not any problem with it, but because of the problem with the reader. But whenever Christ comes and he personifies grace and truth, he, he said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? He is basically demonstrating to the people what had been true all along, but wasn't able to be seen because of the flesh. And so when he says here that, G, that, that the, uh, the law was through Moses, but grace, rather grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ, he is showing that, the, uh, he is, he is showing that Jesus is the one that fulfills the law, and reveals the true purposes and intentions of the law. And he, is, he has done for us what the law could not do because he took away uh, that limitation of the flesh by fulfilling the righteous requirement of the law on our behalf in order that we could approach God not through our own righteousness but through his righteousness. So that's kind of what I, how I see that expression uh, in verse 18 about or rather, verse 17 about the law given through Moses, grace and truth coming through Christ. So, Okay, so he says that Jesus is full of grace and truth. Now, John, uh, John the Baptist, he testifies about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Now, what's peculiar about that expression uh, he existed before me is the fact that John was several months, if you recall from the book of Luke, older than Jesus. Remember whenever uh, Mary went to go announce her pregnancy, uh, Elizabeth was already well pregnant, right? And so when he says he existed before me, it's speaking to what we read in Genesis, rather in uh, John chapter 1 verse 1, about the word being God and the word existing before the world began and having something to do with the creation of the world. And so, this again is a passage that testifies to the pre-existence of Jesus. Jesus wasn't just a good man or a good prophet. He was part of the Godhead, God in the flesh. And so, that's what he means there by he existed before me. Okay, uh, verse 16. He says, For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. Now, the Apostle Paul said in Colossians chapter 1, if you recall that, in verse uh, 19, he says, For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him. That is the fullness of deity, the fullness of the Godhead bodily, is how the King James Version says that. And so whenever, and notice what he says that, that he would do because of that fullness, and through him to reconcile all things to himself, have you made peace through the blood of his cross 
through him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. And so uh, Jesus had the entire fullness of the Godhead dwelling within him, the fullness of deity dwelling in him, in order that he might reconcile, as he says there, all things to himself and make peace through his death on the cross. And so in uh, John chapter 1 and verse 16, when he talks about that we have received his fullness, what he's indicating there to us in John 1, 16, is that Jesus has paved the way again for us to be in the full presence of the Father. You recall how in uh, the book of Genesis that we talked about last week, they put the cherubim in the way with the flaming sword that turned every way. And I kind of said it quickly there, but they put the flaming sword in the way. And that's why Jesus says, I am the way. He's the way to reconnect us with God uh, that was pictured in the garden in Genesis chapter 2. It's through Jesus that we have a full relationship, both in this life and the next, uh, with the Father. And so... He says there in verse 16 that we've received grace upon grace because of this. This was something that the law was not able to do because of of the human condition. And so, and that's exactly what he says in verse 17. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. So in verses 16 to 17, what you see is it was in Jesus that the fullness dwells. All right? That is... Everything that is named is in Jesus. You know, we talked about uh, there's no other name in heaven given among men whereby men must be saved, and he's higher than every single name on earth, principalities and powers and all that. Okay, so it was because of that power and authority that Jesus had that he was able to extend this type of relationship through humanity, and this was something that the law could not do, which is why he says that grace and truth were realized, or rather came to be, through Jesus Christ. But the law was instrumental in the process because it foreshadowed all of this, uh, as Paul spends most of his time talking about. Now here's what he says in verse 18. He says, No one has seen God at any time. That is, prior to this, no one was able to come to a full face-to-face relationship with God. Okay? In 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 the purest sense. He said, the only begotten of the Father, or rather, the only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. So, up to this point, approaching God into his full presence was not yet a possibility because of the limitations of the flesh. But what Jesus has done, he says, is he has revealed the Father, he's revealed grace and truth, and he has explained the Father in such a way so that we can go into the Father's presence, which is what he gets into in John chapter 14, which is Paul's whole discussion in 2 Corinthians 3 as well. And so, so far in John chapter 1, 1 through 18, we have this. Jesus is the Word. He preexisted. He was part of, uh, he was part of the, uh, of, of creating, the, he, he took part in creating the universe. Then he talks about how Jesus is the light and Jesus is the life of man. And so if we're going to have life, then we need to walk in the light as he is in the light. We need to be in him. He says here in uh, John chapter 1 that there was a man sent from God whose name was John to testify of this life and this light, of this word, of Jesus. And those that would receive him would be able to become a child of God through the will of God, not through the will of the flesh. And now here finally in John chapter 1 in verses 14 through 18, we see that was made possible because Jesus has brought grace upon grace through explaining who God is and giving us the opportunity to enter into his presence. So that's what we have so far in John chapter 1, 1 through 18. Does anybody have any uh, questions or comments about that so far? Okay. Verse 19. He says, This is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. I am not the Messiah. So some of the Jews thought maybe he was the one that would lead them uh, in a revolt against Rome is what they expected. And so they say, are you... Uh, this, are you the Christ? And he says, no. So they ask him in verse 21, 
what then? So are you Elijah? And he said, I'm not Elijah. I'm not, he says. He said, are you the prophet? And he answered, no. Now, when they ask him if he's Elijah, that might cause us a little bit of confusion because there's multiple times, like in uh, the book of Matthew, for instance, and in Luke chapter 9, I believe it is, where Jesus calls, uh, calls John Elijah, several occasions there. But this is where, and that's where the confusion comes in. Was John Elijah or was he not? Well, I think the question here in verse 21 is, are you Elijah? See, because what happened to Elijah? Yeah, he's carried off into a whirlwind. So I think what they're asking here in verse 21 is, are you Elijah? You know, have you come back, right? And so what Jesus had said in uh, talking to his disciples was, John the Baptist was Elijah, uh, if you're willing to receive it, referencing Malachi chapter 3 and 4. Okay, so John wasn't literally Elijah. He wasn't Elijah reincarnated or something like that. But he was uh, f the fulfillment of the prophecies talking about the arrival of Elijah. Question? Oh, that were taken? Yeah, that didn't actually die. Right, uh, Enoch. That's right. That's it. It's Elijah. Well, well, there you go. You got it now. <laughs> when he asks him if he's the prophet in verse 21 there, what's he, what's he referring to? Do you know what passage he's talking about there? Are you that prophet? Are you, are you the prophet? Yeah. That, we're always, I forget what verse is, but they're always talking about a prophet. Um, it's uh, Deuteronomy 18. That the Lord God will raise up a prophet. Right, like Moses. Yep. Yep, that's right. That's right. And so uh, they're wanting to know if he's, if he's actually Elijah. You know, if he's Elijah, let's come back. He says, no. So is he the prophet? I know I'm not. Now, here's what he says in verse 22. Or they said to him, who are you so that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. As Isaiah the prophet said. Now that's a reference. Excuse me. That's a reference to Isaiah chapter forty and verse three, if you just want to have it for your record. But if you go back there to Isaiah forty-three, notice what he says in the next passage. Well, it's actually verse five. He says, "Then the glory of the Lord will be revealed, and all flesh will see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken." Now that should mean something to you because what did he just say in John chapter one? And verse, uh, let's see, John chapter 1 and verse 14. The Word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we saw His glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. And so, uh, whenever John the Baptist quotes from Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3, it's within that context predicting that they would see the glory of God, and they did, through Jesus, as, we, as you can see in Isaiah 40 and verse 5. Now, uh, here's something interesting about this passage that John is quoting from in Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3. It is one of the few passages in the, in the New Testament that is, uh, rather, in the Old Testament that's quoted in every single gospel account. I've told you that before, but here they are. Uh, Matthew 3.3, 3, uh, Mark 1.3, and Luke 3.4. They're all up there on the screen if you want to see them there. But this is one of one of the few that's quoted in every single gospel account, um, which tells you it must be significant to the apostles' understanding of what Jesus had come to do. Now, uh, what is interesting about that is we only have two examples of Jesus' birth from Matthew and Luke, and yet this passage is mentioned in every single account, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, as well as you know the death of Christ and things like that. So it's just really interesting that this is one of the few that's included like that. So I just thought I'd point that out to you. The reason why John quotes this passage uh, from Isaiah chapter 40, if you go back and you look at Isaiah 40, and if you were to read you know, the whole thing, here, here's what he says in verse 2. Speak kindly to Jerusalem and call out to her. That's why he says he, cried, he was crying out. 
and call out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity has been removed, that she has received of the Lord's hand, double for all of her sins. He goes on uh, to say, let's see, uh, say this in verse 10, Behold, the Lord God will come with might, his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. And then he says, like a shepherd, he will tend his flock. An arm, he will gather the lambs, carry them in his bosom. He will, lead, he will gently lead the nursing ewes. And so what this passage is talking about is a, uh, a future to them, restoration of Israel. Uh, returning them to the land, taking care of them like he once did, things like that. And so whenever John mentions this from Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 3 to introduce himself to the people, what he's saying is, is he's paving the way for the restoration of Israel in Christ. And this entire book of John, um, a, lot of the, a lot of the book is, is, is built around the different feast days that are mentioned in Leviticus chapter 23 and how Jesus fulfilled those various feast days. And the book is built around uh, these signs that, uh, that hinted to Israel that they were being restored. Like, for example, Jesus stands up on the Feast of Tabernacles and talks about water that would flow out of their bellies. Out of their bellies would flow living water, which was a reference to Zechariah 14, which is about... Uh, which is, which is about the restoration of Israel as well. And so him starting off the entire book in this way, as the other gospel writers did, indicated that the gospel writers believed that Jesus would be the one to restore Israel. That's a big deal. Uh, in, in the church, we don't typically talk much about the restoration of Israel, traditionally, because that's what the premillennialists talk about. You know, They talk about Jesus coming back in our future to restore Israel and things like that. So that was never really a big deal for us. We just said, well, you know, we understood this, basically, that Israel was restored in the church. But when you get into conversations with people um, who aren't familiar with that, like we've been raised, uh, you know, been raised being taught that, then this right here is a really good passage to use, John's citation of it, to show that John thought, and all the gospel writers thought, way after the fact, that Jesus was the one fulfilling those promises. So this is just a good passage to keep in your back pocket to keep in mind that this was the purpose of Jesus' ministry, at least one of them, was to restore Israel. Okay, let's look at uh, 20, uh, 24. He says, Now they had been sent from the Pharisees. So they asked him and said to him, Why then are you baptizing if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. It is he who comes after me, the thong of whose sandal I am not worthy to untie. Now we know the rest of this passage, because uh, we, we know what else John had to say about this, because he said he baptizes with water, but the one that was coming after him would not just baptize with water, he'd baptize with the Spirit and with fire, right? And so... Uh, there seems to be then this indication that John's baptism wasn't the, wasn't the real baptism that they were going to experience. This was a preparatory thing because John only baptized with water. Uh, what Jesus is going to introduce in John chapter 3 is that there is a, a, uh, a, a different kind of baptism that doesn't just involve water, but it also involves a spirit, right? And so we're going to get to that because even Jesus, you know, was having his disciples baptized in the wilderness. And so John only baptized with water. The Holy Spirit at this point had nothing to do with that baptism. It was a baptism of preparation. And uh, where, did, where did John go out baptizing people? At the Jordan River. See, he didn't pick that location by chance uh, because whenever the people came up from Whenever the people came up from uh, Egypt, if you recall, so you have here the Jordan River, you have here the uh, Mediterranean Sea, and you got, you know you got the seas there. When they came over into the Promised Land, two of the tribes stayed over here. What happened to the water? The water it, yeah, the water separated when they came into the Promised Land. Who else did that though? Two other people did that, caused the water to separate. 
Elijah and Elisha. Elijah went over, caused the water to separate there. Elisha came back, caused it to separate on his way back. So when, whenever John is baptizing people in the wilderness, that's a callback to those events. And what it tells us is that what John was doing was basically sort of a reset. Think about it. Let's go back to the Jordan. Let's start over. Let's come back into the land again, and let's do this thing right. You know, He's basically uh, taking the people back out and then bringing them back in almost as a as sort, of a re, as sort of a reset back to Joshua chapter 5 whenever they first came out of the wilderness into the promised land. That's kind of, yeah, that's kind of how I see it. It's, uh, and so it was a baptism of preparation, getting their hearts and minds ready for Jesus' ministry and teaching You know, here in a few chapters. Anybody have any thoughts on that? All right, let's take a look at uh, verse 28. Notice what it says. Uh, These things took place in Bethany beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. Now the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who has a higher uh, rank than I, for he existed before me. Now, let's just stop reading right there for a moment. Notice he says, Behold the Lamb of God. That should take us back to what feast day? The uh, Sabbath? Not Sabbath, but the uh, Passover. Passover, that's right. And then he says, He takes away the sin of the world. Uh, maybe your version says that too. Does it say sin as in singular or sins as in plural? Singular. singular. So he talks about a singular sin here. He takes away the sin of the world. Now there's a lot of, you know, people have written a lot of uh, articles and books and audios on what exactly that, that sin is. But I just want to point out to you that the word sin is singular. Some suggest it might be the sin, uh, the sin of Adam since he is kind of framing this in a creation context. Uh, You know, the sin of Adam being not trusting in God, but wanting to take out and eat something else so that he could be like God in that way. And that sin is what led him out of the garden, which in turn led many people out of the garden generation after generation, you know, so to speak. So a lot of people might point out that that could be uh, the sin of of Adam, you know, taking away, sort of resetting things back to before the fall. Okay. Uh, Verse 30, he says, This is he, on behalf of whom I said, After me comes a man who has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. I did not recognize him, uh, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing Uh, in or with or by uh, water. So he says, I did not recognize him. (laughs) Which, uh, Why would he say that? Because he was Jesus' cousin, right? So he did not recognize him as the Messiah until he saw him on that day, it appears to me. And so then he sees him, and uh, he says that he, you know, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so he came baptizing with water in order that the Messiah would be manifested Uh, to Israel. Now, here's what he says in verse 32. John testified, saying, I have seen the Spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, He upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit. Now, that kind of gets back to what we talked about earlier, about John baptizing in water but Jesus baptizing with or in the Holy Spirit. Now, uh, here's something interesting about this that I've told you before. We've already mentioned a lot of things about about, uh, John calling back to the book of Genesis. This is another one. Because in uh, Genesis chapter 1, if you recall this, he says in verse uh, 2, The earth was formless and void, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was moving or brooding or hovering over the surface of the waters. 
And that word moving or brooding or hovering um, comes from the word, you know, to describe a, a, a bird who flutters, you know, who flutters and hovers over, over the earth there. And so this bird language <laughs> is used in reference to the Holy Spirit again at Jesus' baptism in John chapter 1. So what he's doing is he's making another connection back to Genesis 1, where the picture is uh, a bird taking care of her young. And this is what we have again with the Spirit descending out of heaven and remaining upon Jesus like a dove. It's to remind us of what was said back in Genesis chapter 1, to remind us again that Jesus is going to be the one to bring about this new creation uh, in him and give life and light to the world. All right. Uh, verse 34 says, I myself have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So that's John's testimony there. Anybody have any comments or questions up to verse 34? All right. Uh, let's see. So verses 35 through 51... Uh, is whenever Jesus begins to pick disciples. And so what we might do is we might hold off on that uh, until, next, until next week. Let's see if there's anything that we might have missed. Nope, that should be, that should be good there. All right, if nobody has anything else, I'll go ahead and cut the recording off there then. And then next week we'll start at verse 35, where Jesus begins to pick his disciples. And then we'll hop right into chapter 2 after that. We should finish the rest of uh, chapter 1 pretty quickly. And then we'll go to chapter 2 and look at his first miracle next week as well. Um, that being said, what you might do, if you just want to, it's not necessary. What you might do is go back and read Isaiah chapter 1 right before Wednesday night Bible study next week. Because when we get to Jesus turning water to wine, there's a reference there to Isaiah chapter 1, a subtle reference to Isaiah 1 that makes more sense if you're already familiar with the passage before we get to John chapter 2. And so you might do that before Bible class next week. Take a look at Isaiah 1.